coming up on Push to Talk. Jan and I get excited about the upcoming Star Wars reveal uh, from Respawn Entertainment. We weren't able to get the episode up in time, but uh, we speculate a little bit about what we uh, want to see out of the upcoming action-adventure narrative-driven Star Wars game. Also, how does a homophobic slur make its way into an art asset in The Division 2? Next, Bill helps me navigate my way through a very messy menu navigation system in Hitman 2016. All this and more on today's show. This is Push to Talk, episode 19, recorded Friday, April 12th, 2019. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash push to talk and browse the large selection of audio programs. Then just download a title for free and start listening. I'm your host, Jan, and welcome, as always, with me. I've got Bill. How are you doing, Bill? Bill? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I think you confused me earlier. You, uh, there was a little chat about uh, someone mispronouncing your name, and for some reason I just called you Bell, which doesn't really make any sense at all. Bell. I've never been called Bell. That doesn't No. Work. You don't I, really strike me as like that, like a Bell, like a female Southern Bell. It's not oh. really... Yeah. I know, see, I was going to say, I don't know a Bell. Well, I know what, it, what, what George Bell, I think he used to play for the Jays, didn't he? Is that a thing? Maybe? There's a few athletes with okay. that last name, I think. But I'm not Bell. Uh, Okay, no, that's Bill. Also with us is Joe. Hey, Joe, how's your uh, start of the weekend going so far? Start of the weekend's going good because it's uh, the day before a vacation, so I'm in good spirits. This is also why we're recording this uh, episode a little bit earlier than usual, so there's unfortunately some news that we, it's coming tomorrow and we can't talk about it yet because we're yeah. a little early, but we will cover that in the next week, and that's, uh, there's a lot of Star Wars stuff. For those that don't know, there's a big Star Wars celebration in Chicago, I think, right now. Sounds right. So uh, there's, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in our top stories in a moment, and um, much more probably next week, depending on how much they actually reveal during that. So moving on to the top stories, we'll get right into that, Joe. What was your top story of this past week? Well, I think I mentioned two to you. So um, without really diving into the star wars topic because i think it is premature for the reasons you mentioned um i very much love respawn's work um I, this is the second show in a row i'm mentioning it titanfall one was a revelation in first person shooting for me a genre that was feeling stale in my opinion um titanfall 2 i think a lot of people took to the to the single player campaign didn't do as much for me personally but i totally get it and um uh you know Seeing what they'll they'll do with an existing ripe IP is very exciting, especially coming from the narrative minds behind a character named Robert Barker, not Bob Barker, of Price is Right fame, but big Robert distinction Barker. There. <laughs> very big distinction. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty excited um, as uh, someone who grew up on uh, Star Wars. I think, like many of us, to see. I'm just. I just want to see something that's being promised to be single player narrative driven man it's been so long it's surprising isn't it i mean like we've that. had some obviously ea has the rights i believe now to uh star wars on the video game front and they've obviously done battlefront and battlefront 2 but while they are star wars games they're not really star wars games if you know what i mean i do do we have more of an appetite for this star wars game because we don't like the way ea has handled it like if this was the first star wars game that we were having since the battlefront series um, the two games that EA has released. It is two, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's two. So let's assume those two games didn't come out and that this is the first one that we were getting. Um, not first ever, but, you know, in recent memory from um, Respawn. Would we be as excited or are we more excited because it's a contrast to what uh, DICE is doing? Sure. I mean, for me, it's just the fact that it um, that it is a single player. So based on what you're saying, yeah, I guess it must be influenced by the multiplayer games that we've only gotten recently yeah yeah i mean it's what i want out of a star wars game i mean honestly if i have to think back to the last good star wars game it would have been like knights of the old republic or something or even dark forces 2 if you go way way back and i want to I, I love the story i want to be in that universe and i want to be there in a 
Star Wars narrative, not in a world where there is a bunch of stormtroopers that, you know, are controlled by 12 year olds that are shooting at me online. That, that's right. me personally. I'm sure lots of people are enjoying that. And, and honestly, like Battlefront 2 um, wasn't bad. I played the single player. It's okay. It wasn't terrible. Yeah, but it was like I, I wouldn't. I don't think anyone would call it a story-driven game. No, no, I think I played it in one sitting. It was like five hours or four hours or something. Um, it wasn't long, but uh, I, I I tend to agree with you. I think that my interest in you taking something like the Star Wars franchise is a story, right? And then it got turned into a live service, and now we're kind of like in the terms of video games, we're about to go back to the story. So that is exciting. Yeah, and the, I think the other reason that we might be more excited about this than um, otherwise is that there had been a couple of story-based Star Wars games in recent years that have been canceled. So I, I feel like this is finally the one where we can say, like, it's actually happening. They're doing it, and it's coming, and it's not just, like, on somebody's roadmap eight years down the road, like a maybe we've assigned a small team to this. Yeah, and it's being done by a studio which has released three bang and good games, and that's it. That's all they've done. Like they're Pretty three much. for three, right? Yep. Yep. I'd say. I think. I think most would agree. Yeah. So uh, there will. There's more news expected on Saturday at the uh, Star Wars celebration. There's a panel. So this is the news that I was referring to that we, we won't have a chance to discuss until next week. But I'm sure we will at that time. Hopefully, we'll get lots of details. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's kind of a a cool thing where you know it's not being announced at any kind of game specific convention it's you know it's all about star wars obviously yeah which I, I was thinking about might um for the better impact the sort of information we get right so the parts that i don't love about like an e3 are some generic you know cg trailer of a game per, you know i think that's a preference thing it doesn't tend to do much for me when i see those things um but what we might get tomorrow uh, is information on plot points, characters, stuff like that, um, since it's not uh, like a gaming uh, audience necessarily. Do, do we want to make a prediction each about what we're going to find out? Uh, sure. Like, I I mean, I think we'll, we'll find out something about the story. I don't think we'll get a release date or a platform or anything like that. I don't yeah. think we'll get I, anything like gamer-specific to that point, like when, where, how... Um, I don't think we'll get that, unfortunately. I think that will probably come later this year at one of the bigger conferences specific to games. I'll take it a step further and say we won't see gameplay. I'll I, take your I, silence as yeah. my opportunity. Uh, <laughs> I, You know what? I really don't have a prediction except to say I think we'll get a release year. I okay. think that, Because I feel like you've got to give them something, right? So you gotta you got to create that hype. And you know, you're saying, well, we, you don't think that you'll see gameplay... Um, if they don't show gameplay and they don't have a release window, then they're kind of, there's no real point in talking about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we'll get a year, you know, maybe like, even if it's like 2020 or something. I, I have one last thing to say about that. And that is, I hope it is not going to be in any way tied to, uh, the new movie that's just been announced. It's coming out this Christmas, like timing wise or content wise. Cause that's been done before where they tried to tie a game into a movie and it's never really worked out well. Yeah. I mean... In general, right? I mean, there's, a, yeah. of course, a few outliers, but yeah, that's not, not usually a great recipe. Right. All right. So what was your second story of the week there? Okay. So this one's more of a pitch to you guys. I mean, I'm assuming that this is not a game that you've, uh, either of you have touched, but back in July of last year, um, Square Enix released Octopath Traveler for the Switch. It was a Switch exclusive up into, up until a day or two ago when it was revealed uh, through a series of leaks, and then I think it eventually an official announcement that uh, Octopath is coming to PCs. Um, am I right in assuming neither of you have played? I, I've, I've heard of it. I didn't play it because when it came out, I didn't own a Switch yet. I flirted with the idea of getting one at that time to play that game and then never got around to it because I felt like I didn't have time for it. But it looked really cool for about five minutes. Wow. Okay, Bill and you? Uh, I assigned people to work on that game. I did not play it. <laughs> so I learned, that doesn't count. I you can't, you can't get credit by Osmosis through your, uh, you know, your minions. Doesn't work. You get away with that statement because you don't work for me. But it's um, true. Yeah. So I here's my prediction for myself. I will okay. buy it. Well, my 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 first question is this to you, Joe. 
You've obviously yeah. played it, I assume. And oh, you, I, so I take it you have a positive response to the game as a whole? More than positive, I fell in love with every piece of it. So I now do own a Switch. So my question to you is, is this a, a better game to be played on the Switch or sitting in my office on the PC? Not knowing oh. any details about the PC version, but, you know, just given the atmosphere and the, the circumstances. So assuming that there is no gameplay differences, right, between the two editions, yeah. Um, yeah, it's no brainer. This is an incredible Switch game. It's just a grind fest, but in the best way. Because we even talked about this last week. I don't necessarily want to grind on a game, but when the grind is so satisfying, a la Octopath Traveler, heck yeah. Um, so there is a lot of like sort of, I think it, it sounds a little crass to say it this way, but like um, mindless activity in Octopath Traveler. But what I really mean by that is that the groove that you fall in while you're leveling up your team is so decadent, I would say. I, I, I know it sounds insane, but um, the way they have... Um, the tools that they've given to you to level up your party stay exciting for a hundred hours. That's how I felt. How many hours do you think you played it? Uh, I know I played it for a hundred or so just because the uh, Switch tells me that. So. Okay. Now, Switch handheld or Switch on a TV? I did both. Um, and and good, great question, I'll say, because the reason I did both is because I don't think I need to explain the merits and the and the and the benefits of playing handheld. Those are obvious, right? Take it anywhere, and you know, right? I yeah, would... it's almost actually for me almost a downside if it's better handheld because I don't really move my switch. Like it's connected to the TV, and yes, I could take it somewhere, but I don't. If I go somewhere, I'm usually not in a position to play. So interesting. So you're definitely a minority. Probably, in that respect. Yeah. yeah. That's why um, I didn't really buy a switch to you know initially. Like I bought it now. It's my. Uh, if I have friends over and we're going to play like what I call a party game, like Smash or uh, any of the the Mario, Mario party games, like it's on the TV and we sit on the couch or stand around like idiots. I mean, that's a, definitely like a great reason to own a Switch, but you, again, yeah, I mean, that's not like most people's reason. The the allure of the device is the is the mobile aspect. Okay, but here's the here's the reason it's still worth it, even though um, even though you're not going to take advantage of that uh, feature, right? Um, is it safe to assume your best audio setup is your television? I guess that's more important too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am not, I I'm into music, right? Like I like making music. I like listening to music. I understand there's probably a bias there, right? I'm not one of these people that like gets into game soundtracks and you know, I, I don't have like a, uh, uh, an affinity specific to game music, right? Mm -hmm. This soundtrack is an unstoppable force. I cannot I cannot convey to you how fun the battle music is. And I must, I mean, I, I just told you how long I played this game. I must have heard that thing for, if it's a, if I played for 100 hours, I must have heard the battle music for 70 hours, right? Right. See, Incredible that's thrown soundtrack. down the gauntlet, too, because I think that some of the best battle music right now is Destiny 2. So it'll be fun for me to compare the two. Now, I'll, now I won't just buy it. I will play it for at least nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to share the soundtrack with you too, if that's the only interest you have in the thing. But uh, <laughs> well, for the but, full experience, um, I got to play it for nine minutes. It, it was exactly what I was going to say. There's something about getting it again into that groove of the grind ma matched against the audio experience. I'm telling you, this thing is like a slam dunk. Loved it. Well, so that's here's my pitch hoping to that the PC version maybe causes a drop in price on the Nintendo, on the Switch version, because the last time I checked, it was still like a full price $60 game or something. Yeah, I mean, Nintendo exclusives, even if they're not developed by Nintendo, tend to be that way. So that's not yeah. too surprising. Yep. All right. Well, Bill, what about your top story this week? My top story is not really a top story. Um, it's more or less just a story that I... When I read it, I had a lot of questions, and that was how a homophobic slur made it into a piece of artwork in The Division 2. Um, the reason is because my initial thought was, wow, that's crazy, because I thought it would be like a big piece of art, like a large um, graphic that would be noticeable. But what it turned out is that it was actually a homophobic slur written on the badge of a, a piece of artwork that showed a police officer. So yeah. easy to miss, right? Like it's a huge game with thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of assets. 
I'm sure they all got checked, but like reading the lettering on a badge in a larger image like that, I think we could all see how that could get by. So I don't look at this as like, wow, it would be soft. You really screwed up. I mean, in a sense, yeah, you got to take responsibility for it. They screwed up. But a person had to do that. Like a person that works for that, for Ubisoft had to do that. You mean come up with the the lettering and the numbering? Yes. They had to, someone created that, right? If I understand it correctly, someone had to make that. So a person had to put that in there. So when Ubisoft says, well, we're going to review our process for, you know, approving these kinds of assets and try to make sure this doesn't happen again, that's the right thing to do. They removed it. They apologized. They're going to address how to stop it from happening in the future. Yeah. But, and we should point out that they did that like immediately, right? Like on the yeah, same day that it was discovered. Yeah, it's already yeah, yesterday, mm-hmm. um, which as it should be. And my thing is someone in the Ubisoft office went to work today, like sweating bullets, man, because someone made that and they're going to find out who made it. So one question is, first of all, like this person not think they would get caught. And second of all, am I wrong? What am I missing? Like, how does who puts that in there and why do they put it in there and why do they think that it's a good idea that they'll get away with? So so the one thing that I, I read about this is that it's supposedly an homage to a punk rock um, promo- promotional song artwork, right? Like, so do you think that you still think somebody actually, I guess they must have actually drawn that in there. Like, it's not really a like a piece of art that they used from somewhere else. It's just weird. It is weird. Yeah, I... I don't know. I think that um, I think that it's tough because I mean, look, you could you can sit there and pass it off and say, um, you know, this is a piece of artwork or this was a tribute to a punk rock band. But um, yeah, I don't know. I still think like somebody lost. Someone's going to lose their job over this, right? Well, and I feel like if it was a tribute to something, like you said, it's part. It's a very small part of a much larger piece of art. Um, and I would imagine that the large piece of art could be an homage to something else, which is fine. But then even if it was, they could have edited it to make, you know, to not repeat that nah, kind of language. I, honestly, but, I don't know. Nah, I don't buy the punk rock thing because here's the, here's why you, it, you know what it says, you know what it says. Yeah. So I don't care if it could be interpreted in a positive way. You also understand that it could be interpreted in a negative way. And you have that cop eating a donut, which could be looked at like a rainbow sprinkled donut. Yeah. Okay. They meant that that's, yeah, come on. Like I'm not, I don't give the benefit of the doubt there. Somebody made that and they made it for a malicious reason. As far as I'm concerned, I, I'm not a court. I don't have to prove it. You know what I mean? I don't need, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go look for that person and crucify that person in any way. Uh, nothing like that. I'm just saying my instinct tells me that was intentional. That was malicious. I don't really, unless something really convincing comes out, but the idea like, well, it, it, it's related to punk rock. Well, okay, but it also, you have to be smart enough to understand how it's going to be interpreted by the majority of people. Well, sure, because it doesn't matter that it was an homage to punk It's It's like saying, you know, uh, some the daughter on Modern Family can drop 16 F-bombs in a, in a row because it's an homage to a Kesha song. Well, right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still, you know, yeah. it's still breaking FCC guidelines, so it doesn't matter. No, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and I also hate that about society and not all of society, but there's a small portion of society. And I think if anything, that the fact that it might've been related to punk rock in some way, and I'm sorry, I didn't see that, um, that follow up to it, but well, I, I don't know what that is. I'm just looking at uh, my the point is, post, is but... that people use opportunities like that to hide racism or to hide homophobia. They're oh, looking, sure. you know what I mean? So that yeah. is more likely to be what I think happened is someone said, well, I actually have an out. I can say that it was related to this, not to this. And I hate that justification. I don't like people. Tend yeah, there, to, there, yeah. there is no, there is no justification for it. Right. No matter right. what you're that, whoever created it, no matter what their reasoning. And I, I use that in air quotes, uh, is it's, it's wrong. So you're either a, homophobic to put that into a game with malicious intent or you're an absolute idiot and either way you shouldn't be working there yeah i don't like flip the coin i don't care which side it lands on but you're either oblivious and should not be working there and shouldn't be able to create things that other people can and like can see or you're malicious and you shouldn't be able to create things that other people can see like i don't like either way get out that's my opinion so yep 
Well, take. hopefully, hopefully Ubisoft improving their processes, as they said, will lead to this not happening again in the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, they have a decent version control software to see who committed that atrocity. Yeah, I agree. But I also think it's impossible to stop. If you had like the games are so big these days, like you could probably sneak something in somewhere. If it's not a big mural on a building, you know, it could be um, a tiny little thing. Like there has to be opportunity for people who want to do those things that they're going to be able to do them um yeah and there, there's all kinds of uh ranges of people doing weird things and games that they think they can get away with not just games but i guess workplaces in general i guess what it comes down to is hopefully it leads to just a little more common sense and you know um, i don't know i mean uh, having having it seems like we're obviously encountering a lot of these stories lately and i guess the more they're brought out into the public the better in general yeah, and I think there has to be, and I would rather be, I would rather overkill um, my zero tolerance for BS than give someone the benefit of the doubt on this, because I think that we've got to eliminate the space for people to say, well, I really meant it this way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't give people that space. And maybe that's, I don't know, like, a lot of people may not agree with me on that, but um, I don't see a manner in which this was an accident and if it was an accident that it was something that isn't still completely unacceptable right agreed i think we're all in agreement here um preach bill all right moving on to my top story and this is a, a bit us. more on the cheery side if you will um this is about uh, a new content update coming at the end of april to sea of thieves this is going to be their one year anniversary update and um one of your colleagues actually uh went over to uh, you go to the UK, I believe, to visit with Rare, the developers, and got like a hands-on sneak peek at some of the new stuff coming. And there's a lot of new content coming to Sea of Thieves on April 30th that I'm particularly excited about because we used to play this game when it first came out. Um, I think we probably got our fill out of it when it first released, and we enjoyed it quite a bit. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bill. But, you know, we played it until we sort of ran out of things to do. Now, my understanding is that there has been lots of new content added since then, but this looks like a great place to jump back into the game for people like you and I that have taken a break from it over the last uh, six months or so. So what are they adding? Well, the one thing that I'm most excited about is they're adding something that they call Tall Tales, which is actually a campaign-like story to the, uh, being added to the game. So, I mean, for those that don't know, but Sea of Thieves is basically, you know, you're on this open, large, reasonably large sea, and you kind of have to make your own story. You know, there's a few missions you do here and there, but there isn't a an actual campaign-like experience, but they're adding this now where you actually go on what seems to be like an episodic type of adventure where you encounter, you know, puzzles and you have to fight skeletons and all the usual stuff, but with more of a purpose other than just having fun. So to me, that sounds pretty exciting. Uh, apparently, this first campaign is called Shores of Gold. It will take anywhere around 10 to 20 hours to complete, according to Sam's article over at Shack News. And um, it then unlocks... Uh, a new place as well. So you're actually making progress in the game. Like they've actually expanded the map a little bit, which is a, a new island, uh, which is also, I think, the biggest island that they've ever added. Um, now, Bill, what do you think? I mean, we've played uh, Sea of Thieves a fair bit. We had some fun with it. One of our friends tended to get seasick, which was a, a kind of amusing for the rest of us. Um, yeah, what anytime you time Dusty doesn't, uh, he feels sick. It's it's usually pretty good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm excited for it. Uh, I've, it's one of those games where I've kind of wanted to go back to it for a while and I've wanted to experience it again, but it just kind of got lost in the, uh, the shuffle of other games that are coming out and other priorities, but it's weird. It's like with this update coming, they've kind of barged through and made themselves the priority because there's yeah, just too much cool stuff to ignore. I think we needed a good reason, right? And actually about a month ago, I asked Sam who has been playing Sea of Thieves pretty much continually like i asked him is now a good time to come back and he said well you know at the end of the month there's going to be you know it's the one year anniversary there'll be new stuff might as well wait a couple more weeks and then jump back into all the new content one of the things i know you're going to like is you're going to be able to go fishing like That's actually do. fishing and you catch the fish and you cook the fish or you sell them and you actually eat them yep. so i know what you're doing I... wait so is that is that the only other food besides the banana i've only played like an hour uh i think I'm trying to see if they if you can also. I know you used to be able to hunt and catch pigs. 
Uh, I don't know if you can cook them, but I think it's mostly just fish. Like I know the fishing is actually quite elaborate. Um, you know, different locations, different times of day will actually give you different types of fish. Right. Um, that have different values. And I'm sure, you know, you're going to have to go through and catch every fish. It, I'm sure there's an achievement of some sort, if no other reason than to be like, you know, the pride of your fisherman life in Sea of Thieves. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, when a game has fishing, 10 out of 10. That's all I do. I just go fishing. Like, to put that in context of how much fishing I'm about to do in Sea of Thieves, that's all I'm doing. Like, if you think I'm right. going to be helping <laughs> with the sales, yeah, I'm in the wrong crew. I got fishing to do. Um, I play The Sims 4. I actually am a big fan of The Sims franchise in general. I play The Sims 4. I never get a job. I just become a full-time fisherman. That's it. Like, that's a job, Bill. This is it, it, that's what I'm saying. slightly unrelated, but there is a new update coming to The Sims 4 where you can be a freelance worker and work from home. I ooh. That's also a thing. I just want to throw that out there for you. question is, though, can you fish from home? Is really the question. Home. Yes, you can. I, there's a lot um, that I usually park my butt on in The Sims 4, and my backyard just goes right onto the river. So I can fish from home. 100%. <laughs> uh, Joe, to your point, though, yes, there are actually other food items as well. So it's not only just these magic bananas that somehow you know give you back all your health. Uh, I think they've actually nerfed the banana, if that's a term. Uh, that I can use, but they, they've added, you know, obviously different varieties of fish, but the pigs, the chicken, uh, existing things like the snake. Um, apparently, you can even catch the megalodon and cook that up, and probably feed a whole big crew from that. That's um, probably the only thing that would stop me from fishing is going bigger fishing. Well, you can you <laughs> can still go bigger fishing with the harpoon, which they're also adding. So you know, obviously a, a new type of gun, and apparently it's it's quite versatile. Whatever you hit with the harpoon, you can either reel in, or if it's bigger than your ship, it will you know pull you. <laughs> so very it's cool be good. Game. You've gotten me. Yeah. Your news story, sir, has me hyped to go back to Sea of Thieves. Good for you. That is the point. So yeah. Sam had me that. hyped, but just you know this conversation is kind of yeah. And now I'm in the mood <laughs> for fishing. Uh, awesome. Yeah. All right, I want to introduce you to our first sponsor on Push to Talk. We mentioned it earlier at the opening of the show, but we're now sponsored by Audible. And what that means is that you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash push to talk and sign up for a free trial, which gives you one free audiobook. And our suggestion for this episode, we're going to have a suggestion most likely every episode, and we're going to try to pick one that relates. So you're not going to get gardening tips from us or something. Uh, it will be relevant to the content we cover here on Push to Talk. And this first one is actually the book by Jason Schreier, who we mentioned last week when we talked about his Bioware expose. And the book is entitled Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, and it's all about behind the scenes of game development. And interestingly enough, the book actually covers some challenges that Bioware faced when they made Dragon Age Inquisition, and also talks about Bungie spinning off from Microsoft way back when they made Destiny. So it's a very interesting read or listen in this case. So if you want to give that a try, you can head over to audibletrial.com slash push to talk and get your free audiobook today. So moving on to what we played this past week. Now, realizing we're recording a little bit early, so it's a bit more of a condensed week, there's a game I wanted to try out this week and I haven't got to yet, so that will fall into the next week. But I will start with you, Bill. What have you been playing in the past week or so? Well, I had to log into Destiny a couple times, and I'm gonna. You I'm had gonna, to. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you what I've been playing this week with with uh, lots of sighing in between. So I had to log into Destiny a couple times, you know, just on my quest to keep up with that game. So nothing to report, nothing fantastic. Like it's Destiny. I'm keeping up, but other than that, uh, Division Two, and um, I'd say seventy percent of that is because that's what you're playing and then 30 percent is because i actually want to play it on my own um so those are the two the, the division probably more than anything i i might have i don't know like four to five hours a day in it right now at this point um whenever you log on that's when i log on and i usually stay for a couple hours after you're there um so i've been playing lots of the division two and i will say this last night was probably the first time i'm still having fun I still like the game. I still like the loot. But last time was the first time that I saw the end of the road for myself. 
with the Division Two. We should point out that we've now reached World Tier 5, so we've completed the last original Stronghold that's currently available. I think there's more coming in the future. Well, there certainly is, for sure. Uh, so we've kind of gotten to the top tier now. Is that part of the reason why you feel like you've reached the end of the line, or you can see the end in the distance? No, it's because I don't like the way the difficulty scales. Um, Interesting. Like... I, you know, like back when the first game came out, one of my primary complaints was the fact that everything was a bullet sponge, and I believe they've just repeated that. They've just tried to hide it better. Um, so when you're playing a normal activity, it's fine. You know, enemies die, but the really tough enemies take longer to die. When you're playing um, a, like a very difficult activity, the way that they create this difficulty is not by the enemy having better powers or the enemy being, you know more interesting or having like a different gear or even a different enemy type it's really just you shoot it for a lot longer and i'm like we did a um uh control point last night and it was a tier three which is not even the highest tier and i was like yeah i don't want to do this anymore like that's that's what hit me yeah it did take it did take a while longer than i think maybe we anticipated um i without getting into a whole discussion about the bullet the sponginess of the enemies in the division two i think they've actually improved that quite significantly to the point where they can't really do much more with human enemies um i know they always get compared to destiny or destiny 2 but you know obviously any kind of fantasy genre has the benefit of just being able to make stuff up like this enemy has x amount of health because it's a green knight from a different dimension you know not bob from around the corner that has put on a a uh, garbage bag for a hat and grab the latest, uh, you know, the nearest garbage bin lid as a shield and it's rushing you. But I do understand the points that you're trying to make because it does seem like they could be a little bit more imaginative, I guess, at the higher difficulty levels. Yeah, I think so. Um, it, it really, and I think they do have more options available to them. Like, I mean, there's certain missions where, you know, you've got to blow up a tank or something. Um, and it been gr granted, you just have to shoot it a lot. Uh, but... I think that there's opportunities for them to use their environment and to maybe use equipment and gadgets. Like, um, they have like those robot dogs, right? Like mm -hmm. those are interesting. They're not bad. Like they take a bit to kill, but they're, they're not bad. My problem is when I see a standard soldier who just has a ridiculous shield for fun. And I, you know, I can, I can spend multiple full magazines of ammunition, um, even hitting weak points. And it's, it's just one of those things where, I could handle the level of grind if I was really invested in the world, but I'm really not. So we'll see. Still like I, it. I think the thing that, or one of the reasons, I guess, now that we're in World Tier 5, one of the reasons I want to keep playing it is because that there is still a few, I don't know, I'm like, I'm a collector, I guess. Like, my gameplay style is that of a collector. I want to have all the things. Um, so there's still some exotic weapons out there that we need to get our hands on. We finally managed to get our hands on the 12th hunter mask mm -hmm. after we couldn't decide if there was a bug or just some real inconsistency in getting that guy to spawn but we finally managed to get that done so that's one checkbox marked off on the, you know the list of things that i wanted to accomplish and i'm kind of hoping that ubisoft and massive will keep rolling out content to keep me coming back that's not just you know min maxing gear i know that's a big part of the division two and it was in the first game as well and i think it actually does that quite well like you have different options for re recalibrating your gear and all that kind of stuff that's not necessarily what i like to do as much um i i, I want more strongholds because that last stronghold we did was actually quite entertaining i had a lot of fun doing that yeah stuff like that's really good i just feel like we're going to run out of that stuff um we're going to run out of being able to just do a regular mission with regular enemies uh, pretty quick, and it's going to be like, well, we need to play this on challenging, or there's no point. And we know, and I know how they're going to handle the difficulty there. There's lots of stuff I still want to do because I agree with you. I am after gear, and even right now, like as you say this, I'm like, oh yeah, there's gear I want to get tonight. So you know, um, it. I'm still hooked, but this was the first time that, like, in the distance, I was seeing maybe the end of my road. What was interesting is that we're both easily over 60 hours into that game. And when we finished that stronghold yesterday, the first type of a new item classification dropped for us. Yeah, I'm actually over three days in now. I'm over 72. Wow. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm probably 75 or 76 now. 
So you so, guys have played two two Divi- uh, I almost said Divinity. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I I heard about the uh, new uh, Divinity game. The, Excellent uh, tactics game, too. game. Very much love Divinity Original Sin. Um, I was going to say you're two Division games deep now. Um, do you separately or together feel that the setting is a hindrance or sort of like a defining characteristic to the experience at this point? I I quite like the setting, but I feel like, especially in The Division 2, they are let down a little bit by the story. It's much weaker than the first game, and, you know, it, it feels like it should be better. Like, there are little hints and pieces, and every once in a while we get into this little side mission, and there's like a blurb about something where, like, I see there's something bigger going on behind the scenes, and I don't know if it's just their plan to roll this out over the next two years and make it a longer story arc, or if there's just nothing behind that curtain. Um, but every once in a while I get, like, a, an inkling of that there could be more, and then I'm disappointed that there isn't more yet. So then th- then it is not the setting. It's not the setting's fault. Meaning, not for like me. you're no. Your interest is peaked by the sounds of it, and then they're just maybe not just following through. Mm-hmm. And I also, yeah. the other thing I will say is that now on the higher world tiers, there's just too much stuff going on. Like, you can't go from point A to B without being distracted by 18 other activities that are all there. Like, it is so busy. It's one like of, a mall on a hot summer day, and everyone most, has guns. One <laughs> of the most annoying things for me that was actually fantastic. Last night, um, I spawned at a control point, because I wanted to take one, not a level three, but just a basic one that I can handle solo. Um, so I went down the street and I made it without getting into any huge firefights, which is like you said, a minor miracle. I fought my way through and killed everyone around, like everyone. Radar is empty, but I couldn't take the control point because one tool bag walked two blocks down the road <laughs> trying to shoot a bunch of npcs that were carrying up i don't even know probably a banana from uh sea of thieves and i had to go down the street i had to like hunt this guy down and kill random enemies along the path until i finally shot the right one and then it's like oh by the way you can take that control point now yeah <laughs> but i was I, just I, impressed that he could he could go for a walkabout like that <laughs> they have done a a very good job of sort of having there be reasonable things that relate to what you're trying to do. So I'm not putting that into words very well, but if you're trying to take a control point, there are other activities that impact your ability to do that, right? Sometimes you have to go do them. Sometimes you can avoid them. Sometimes they get in your way and it does make the world feel more alive because there's stuff going on. There's NPCs, friendly guys walking off on patrol gathering materials to resupply a control point and you can interact with all that you can help them you can walk with them you can just ignore them but on the flip side you have those weird scenarios where sometimes the ai just goes weird and one enemy wanders off to starbucks saying screw all of that i'm out but yeah you have to go find him because he's part of that group that you need to defeat um definitely so that's a little it's it's funny um it's more of a glitch right i mean that's that you would categorize that as a glitch yeah, or, you know, maybe. maybe it's just like a small AI thing. You know, it's the kind of thing that will... Uh, I don't know if it, it is a glitch, though, because an enemy patrol can walk blocks, and it wasn't someone at the control point. What it was was that um, a group of enemies were attacking the control point. So that stopped me from being able to own that control point until they were no longer attacking it. But he just kept going. Mm-hmm. Right, so he wasn't supposed to be stuck at the control point with the other guards. He was literally one of the wandering NPCs that just forgot where he was going and kept on walking. So it was, but they they can walk a long distance. Um, so I don't know if it's a glitch. It's it'll get old pretty quick, but it was kind of cool because I'm like, okay, I guess we're uh, we're going on a hunt. <laughs> one of the one of the most amusing things that I've encountered recently was when you take a control point, you're typically supposed to talk to this NPC who's the control point officer, and you can you know give him or her items to you know uh, refill the control point, and it gives you benefits and stuff like that. But the last few times after we liberated this control point and took it over, the guy in charge just he must have smelled something or heard something three blocks away because he took out his pistol put it up, aimed down sights, and started slowly inching in that direction, meaning I couldn't talk to him. Like, But yeah. you also can't, you know, it's not like the AI is not so good that you can interrupt what they're trying to do. Like, that character now has a mission, and he's going to go see it through, <laughs> whether you want to give him water or not. 
Yeah, definitely. That's uh, I've encountered that. I've also had my control point officer die quite frequently because I'm busy. So thankfully, you can revive those guys. Oh no, he died. Died. Uh, oh, did they he? Sent, yeah, they sent a new one. It was fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, yeah. Joe? What have you been spending your time with? Uh, a couple games. Um, and why don't you all just hop on my back while I carry you <laughs> <laughs> through this segment? Because I think you're gonna you're gonna be on your your live games by the sounds of it from uh, now till kin- Kingdom Come. But I've been playing. Uh, I I've, I got through Econoclasts. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that. I've heard of the but, name. I don't really know much about it. It's a. It's just one of those like you've probably seen it. And you're like, wow, what beautiful uh, sprite work, what beautiful pixel art. It's one of those like highly polished, um, you know, indie pixel art games that that are becoming more and more common. Um, it's a uh, it's an action platformer disguised as a Metroidvania, uh, which is to say that the Metroidvania elements are pretty much non-existent. Um, there's a couple of things that you might want to run back to to like be a completionist, um, but it's not really a core gameplay uh, loop to you know be back backtracking and and revisiting locations or anything. Um, I didn't love it. Um, I w- I would say that it was super competent, and that's about the extent of it. Um, beautiful to look at, but not not very engaging for my taste. So um, I'll be um, archiving that one with very little fanfare, I think. Um, and then the other much, thing that I... Sorry, I didn't want to yeah, distract sure. you too much, but how, how much, when this situation occurs, right? You've got a game, you think, okay, this might be cool, I'm going to play it. Like, how much, what's your patience level for how, until you know whether you like it or archive it, like you said? Like, some people will literally finish and be like, I hated every minute of that. Um, and other people will take five minutes and be like, nope. So, so I did finish it. Oh, you did? Um, okay. I did, and I... As I've gotten older, I try to be a person that finishes things, and I think it's because it's it's money that I'm spending, right? And I want to I want to sort of like make myself value my money more. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, and by by investing my own time in the things I spend money on, it'll make me a better shopper. I I think that's me being psychoanalyst beyond what's necessary for the, for that question, but I think that is what's happening. <laughs> it's I think I need to hang out with you more. Yeah, we both could. Yeah, we're like, bye, 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 bye. And then I don't get me wrong. Like, I definitely buy more than I could ever complete in my lifetime. No question. You know, but um, when it comes to me cracking open something, um, and playing more than five minutes of it, right? Like Sekiro, we talked about last week. Last week, and it was super obvious to me. Like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to play this. And 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 uh, to <laughs> quick tangent off that, I was I'm not rooting against the game by any means. I am not, but I was glad over the course of this week to see finally some um, editorial and even some Reddit comments, just people admitting like, "Yeah, give me a break. I can't play this game. It's ridiculous." So that was yeah. a little comforting to me that I'm not alone there. We should um, we should we should uh, mark that for discussion on the next podcast because I actually have thoughts on that, but I don't want to derail us. Um, yeah, sure. Although I, I don't so. care if you derail me, really. No, it's just about, um, I see a lot of stories, and I'll just introduce it, but then we can decide to table it until the future. Um, it's the, I don't care about whether or not it's hard for the average gamer, right? For the person that, um, hard and easy, I don't think, I think that's the wrong discussion. It's about accessibility for me, for people, like, and I think we might have touched on this previously. Um, so, if you know, a bunch of people are saying, well, oh, it's just, it's too hard, make it easier. I don't have any time for that. Uh, but if it's somebody that's saying, I literally physically cannot complete this game because, you know, I have a disability, then that's where I think the discussion should be, not on whether it needs an easy mode for people that just find it too hard because, you know, they don't like hard things. Sure. So yeah, that's I really, don't know. Yeah, I don't know where this game falls, to be honest with you, because I think it is probably a matter of like supreme patience, right? Getting good at Sekiro, I think is probably a matter of patience. And of course, like, you know, the mobility and the facility to move your fingers, of course, like no question. But I mean, it's about memorization. It's about um, willpower to say like, okay, I'm going to run that back, right? Because that, I mean, let's not discount that notion that it requires 
like discipline, personal discipline to like try again so many times. To me, I I would I would personally think that that's more where Sekiro lies on that scale, where that it's not necessarily like impossible for a dis a disabled person compared to another video game. It's just that it's exceptionally difficult compared to another uh, video game with the same um, like with the same requirements. If that makes any sense to you, right? No, it does. Um. I will briefly say the other thing I've been playing, and I and I'm not going to dive deep into it because I'm not I'm also not loving it, and I've been um, toying around with um, World of Final Fantasy, which is sort of a homage to decades of Final Fantasy in the form of sort of like a collectathon, like Pokemon style game. Um, so uh, monsters and uh, enemies of games past have been um, sort of redesigned into like a like a, like a like a Digimon Pokemon style where you can imprison them and collect them and, and use them as your uh, battling aids. Um, that part's all well and good. I think the combat's like too easy to be engaging. Um, but the entire wrapper of this experience is uh, killing it for me. The, uh, the, the plot, the story, the dialogue, the voice acting is beyond cringe. Um, and as someone who's like into Final Fantasy, I think that I have a tolerance for cringe, but this is uh, a bridge too far for me. So right now it's, it's, it's not a love affair for sure. That's, I was going to say that's a fair bit of an indictment because you would think that people who would even consider this game would already be Final Fantasy fans of some sort. Like you're not sure. going to make that your first Final Fantasy game ever. You, so you're, you're right and you're wrong, right? Because you could, um, but you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't get it so much right mm -hmm. you could certainly play it but it just wouldn't maybe um ring all the bells that it's trying to ring it's not going to ring all those nostalgia bells that it's that it wants to so it sounds like you're on a little bit of a losing streak here going kind of like oh for three yeah. on the last three games i know yeah. i know it's been it's been a rough couple it's been a rough couple weeks um Kat katana zero is that the name switch exclusive um indie game that's coming out in a couple days i have that pre-purchased it's a uh again very well does well great looking uh 2d beautiful sprite action game i'm always drawn in by that um it's like a one hit kill situation so here i go again right sekiro um <laughs> but i have i have some interest in seeing that that'll be released i think in the coming week so i'll, I'll, I'll talk about that next week wish me luck um yeah we're rooting for you thank you um moving on to our push to talk Hashtag push to talk segment. Last week we asked, um, what games have a well-designed gradual difficulty ramp? And it sounded like that was actually a very, the, rather difficult question to answer. Um, we talked a little bit about difficulty in the last episode. Bill, you just mentioned it again. Um, so we got some feedback about people suggesting that maybe the Stalker games series was... Uh, kind of well designed in that way where the uh you know the difficulty would gradually increase to sort of a realistic element but it kind of you know it wasn't about bullet sponges is what Aiden says on Twitter it was more about you know you being cautious and careful in the game which i guess makes sense but uh Bill you also had a suggestion as to what game might be a well designed gradual difficulty style of game i did and i've been told to expect a fight which is okay <laughs> um you could, I guess, you could apply it to both, but um, the so the 2016 version of Hitman and Hitman 2, um, I believe that they handle difficulty ramping up quite well. Um, my reasoning for this, which I'll introduce so that that Joe can tear it down, is um, both games obviously start off with a tutorial, and it's very simple. It usually involves like one goal, no complications, multiple ways to complete it. Uh, and it does a fantastic job of showing you the mechanics up, right up to and including like, you know, you get on screen prompts if you want them that tell you like, hey, this is what you can do, uh, how you can disguise yourself or this is what you do with weapons. Or if you're carrying a big weapon, people are going to notice like it, it does a good job of teaching in the standard ways. But where I feel that it does a great job with difficulty ramping is that the game gets harder as you go but it also doesn't get grindier as you go because when you do something when you complete something on a lower level or an earlier mission um that experience goes towards unlocking items 
and those items make the next piece of content works accessible. So you might, um, you know, you might pull off a couple of challenges as you're completing the first actual story mission. And because you've done this, you get a, you know, a lockpick. And that lockpick can then be used on future levels so that you can get through locked doors. Um, and the game may throw a few more targets at you, or it may put some conditions on you, or you have to find a piece of evidence, or you have to steal something, or whatever. But it gives you the tools to do so. You never feel like you've come up against something that you can't solve. That's why. It's very off the wall. I struggled with this question like a lot of people. Um, but that's the best example I have of something where I felt like the game kept me, um, it got harder without really ever putting me in a place where I didn't feel like I could deal with it. Okay. Settle down boys. Here we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. I've got the popcorn and everything. <laughs> I, I know. I, I really don't have like a well-constructed debate prepared for you. What I, what I did want to, to, um, throw in your face was that, uh, I made some very good progress on Hitman 2016 uh, over Christmas break a couple months ago. Okay. And this is my first real Hitman experience. Um, I believe we, you know, it was like one of those test facilities, like, like, like a staged event was the kickoff. Yeah. Right. Um, and maybe even there were two of those, if I remember there were like two, two staged. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I agree with you that those were low, uh, low risk, endeavors right it was hard to screw them up and that was a good primer to get you to understand what is ultimately like a pretty complex game engine right there's a lot that can happen in it yes and there's a lot of uh facility that you have within each level what what i personally experienced was that i think maybe seven maybe eighth mission for all i know sixth i have no idea that they, they take like two hours each three hours each for me um you eventually get to like some sort of like viral mission where you, where you have to like subdue infected staff at a facility. Is this ringing okay. a bell? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and whereas I had played the prior, I don't know, five, six missions and felt like they were challenging and that's why they took so long. Right. But I could do them. I hit that mission with the, with the virus outbreak and there was a timer all of a sudden that I had to be concerned with. And it all of a sudden went from, difficult but manageable to in in my in my opinion like crazy hard yeah so you're not wrong i think the timer only pops up once somebody gets infected though if i'm not which mistaken. is easy to happen i thought it is it is easy to happen and i'm not gonna like here's here's my opinion on that was i think the patient zero dlc um and there's several missions that are part of that storyline um that mm -hmm. you go through uh that mission which takes place in hokkaido which is actually a really cool story mission map without the patient zero stuff. Um, like my first visit to that location was awesome. Um, Cause that's not part of the main story, right? Your right, first visit right. there should not have been that. Um, oh, weird. Yeah. So we could talk about the UI for the menus, which is highly confusing in my opinion for that. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> enough. They definitely, I won't defend that. That mission uh, that you're talking about is awful and I didn't like it. I just think it's a bad piece of content, not really a well, represented way that the game moves forward and scales person it so just seemed like interesting awful. though it, i agree but if you're telling me that i like hit it out of order then that changes my opinion on it for sure you, you did it should have been and i'm going off the top of my head and we'll probably get this wrong uh it should have been pair like not including the, the tutorials it should have been paris sapienza uh, mm -hmm. i'm forgetting one right now i'm forgetting one and i can't remember what that is um, oh, sorry, M Marrakesh. Then yep. it should have been Colorado. There's six. Colorado. Colorado was like a like at the a top farm. of like a, a, a farm, farm yep. with a sniper. The last one should have been Hokkaido, and you are just a patient at the hospital. You've got two targets. There's no time limits. There's no infections or anything like that. Like it's just a conclusion to the story. Oh man! So Bill. Not only did you get super pumped up from something Jan talked about, which I'm already blanking on, but now you're pumping me <laughs> sea up. Of <laughs> sea of Thieves. Sea of Thieves. Now I'm all jacked up to go back to Hitman. You should be. It because sounds it's like fantastic. The, the biggest difficulty there was the menu and the UI, not so much the game itself, which is far more common than you would think in games. It's, it's awful. Um, it is really bad. 
it is really really bad um i would yeah i you you if you if that was the first time you hit that level then you the way that you're supposed to hit that level without giving you a spoiler is you actually oddly which kind of counter acts my own argument you don't have any unlocks so you start that mission and you're a patient at a hospital and you're in the hospital and you need to basically work from the inside like inside of a facility to to accomplish your goals but there is no like patient zero exists in the same universe as this hitman story but it is not part of the main story all right all right i'm diving back in because because those other missions everything i played besides that virus mission i thought was outstanding yeah. so so good thanks bill no problem i'm glad that we we're solving problems here <laughs> we really and are. i want to make a mental note for us to at some point discuss why i think that the downfall of the modern game ui is to be blamed on consoles oh we no, can we can have that yeah. we can have that discussion in the future um Real quick, I want to mention that as far as a game that I thought did difficulty scaling really well, it's the last two iterations of the Tomb Raider series, especially the most recent one, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Um, not only did it have very precise difficulty settings for exploration, combat, and puzzles uh, that you know you could actually kind of tailor the game towards how you like to play it, but it's also one of those games where if you're stuck and you wait around long enough, the game knows to nudge you in the right direction and it does so in a way that's not overly you know like like there is a ai hand of god that's telling you what to do like it it flows as part of the game and i think that's what a lot of games need to improve on is just you know allowing you to learn the game um a little bit more naturally so i haven't played um that. yeah i was just about to ask you um i i have uh, a couple months left on xbox game pass and they just released that and i was wondering if it's if it's worth the time i think so i mean it's not it's not uh it's not gonna shatter your world but i would say is if you enjoy the type of movie that tomb raider movies are then you know they're sort of enjoyable fun movies and i think that's what the game is too that's and pretty, it's beautiful yeah. actually it, it's gorgeous um it, it's very pretty cool so i also for me. Uh, i'm gonna give a um i'm gonna give a shout out to the long dark that should have been uh, that should have been my pick for difficulty scaling. More than I think about it. So really, because now yeah. I could start arguing with you. <laughs> no, nah, you could because you haven't played with custom settings. No, this is true. But <laughs> I, I will just say that my very first experience, and it did make me love the game, was loading into the game, walking down a tiny slope, breaking my ankle, and dying in like the first five minutes of playing the game when it first came out in early access. And while I could have easily have gone, screw this, what is the matter with this game? I went, holy crap. It's actually difficult, and I have to be careful. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nightmare in a good way. Um, well, they have the story mode now, which is actually designed yeah. to teach, like the first it episode is trying to teach you. Um, but then, like the four modes they have being uh, Pilgrim, where there's no hostile wildlife unless you literally poke the bear, then there's a hostile wildlife. But if you just like walk near the bear, it runs away. Um, Voyager, where it's like, okay, things will kill you now, but you're probably going to have to get attacked by a wolf four or five times in a row to die. To Stalker, where it's like, maybe three wolves, but there's no loot and it's balls cold. To Interloper, where it's like, you think you know Dark Souls, but here's the long dark. Um, <laughs> and then with custom settings mixed in where you can like literally create your own experience and be like, I hate blizzards, I'm turning those off. Or wolves suck i'm turning those off so i uh, mm -hmm. just a. Uh, I don't want to get into it deeply because obviously like you know i have my pick but that's my honorable mention yeah all right i think that about does it i think we can wrap it up we're at the one hour mark here and um i want to point out that next week we're hoping for some really good star wars game related news to come out tomorrow so i'm sure we'll talk about that in episode 20 i've got my fingers crossed i know joe does i'm not sure about bill bill doesn't really care that much about star wars but I don't it should be correct. interesting. It should be interesting. <laughs> You're going to hopefully humor us next week, because it could very well just be Joe and me talking about Star Wars the whole episode. That's fine. I'll mute myself and have some tacos. Um, <laughs> but I love Star Wars because I don't care about it. I just watch it, I enjoy it, and I let it go. And then I watch the next one, enjoy it, and let it go. That's it. Yeah, that's a good way to be. It's a good way to be in a lot of things, not just Star Wars-related stuff. Sure. I could teach a class.
There you go. We'll let everybody know how you get that. But in the meantime, if you want to reach out to us and let us know your thoughts on Star Wars or how Bill likes to handle his uh, approach to Star Wars, you can do so on social media at Push to Talk FM on Twitter or just visit us online at Push to Talk FM. And of course, you can find us on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Google Play, Spotify, all your usual podcast related websites and services. And we will you'll hear us again in a week from now on Tuesday. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>